Okay, The View Upstairs is a provocative new musical that pulls you inside the upstairs lounge, a vibrant 70s gay bar in the French Quarter of New Orleans. This forgotten community comes to life when a young fashion designer from 2017 buys the abandoned space, setting off an exhilarating journey of seduction and self-exploration that Entertainment Weekly calls a moving homage to LGBT culture, past and present, filled with beautiful love songs performed by a soulful ensemble cast. So please help me welcome to the stage to perform for us now the cast from The View Upstairs. It's 1973, y'all, in the Big Easy, New Orleans. In the summertime heat, down on Iberville Street, sex and incense mixed in the air. Met a man who shook my bones shook it, baby. with one penetrating stare. He penetrated what? <laughs> he said, no reason to fear. Boy, your mama ain't here. Come home with me instead. And it was heaven all alone. Woke up in a stranger's bed. And I said, I think I found some kind of paradise. <laughs> no angel wings, no fairy dust, just a rush of lust. But it's I've spent half the night confused and frightened like a basket case Wondering how the hell I ever ended up here in the first place Got so caught up in trying to find a reason to run away It never crossed my mind I'd want to stay But you gave me a reason to chill <laughs> the fuck out 
It's true I hate myself, but I'd hate myself more if you weren't around. I'd berate myself emotionally, castrate myself, I'd self-medicate, hyperventilate, and eventually break down while you're peacefully sleeping. I'll be stuck weeping in my padded cell. Cause I'm an impossible mess that no one could possibly fix as well as you. This is emotional blackmail. Is it working? No. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Cause we're just getting started. Hey! So give me another chance to ruin your life. I'm a work in progress, but I promise I'll try. To love myself unconditionally, be a person, not a personality. That sounds promising. Oh, well, self awareness is my new thing. Cause I'm a really Shady okay bitch. once in a while, but I promise not to read you for your retro style. You're acting all romantic. Did you hit your head? It's a crazy notion. I'm not good with emotion, but tonight the rules have been shattered. I don't miss my whole life that much When I'm beside you, nothing else matters I finally know what that feels like Well, Wes, remember, we ain't got nowhere to sleep. We got no money. But we've got each other. And besides, I've watched five episodes of Naked and Afraid. I'm totally prepared to survive in the wilderness. Oh. We'll hitch a ride in a rowboat together across the bayou. Live in the middle of nowhere, population of two. And I'll gather wood. I'll learn how to hunt. I'll try hard to be a little less of us. We'll sleep with the wolves in their forest yeah. den. When you look up at the scars, you'll see the stars again. See it all again. It's a crazy notion. I'm not good with emotion. But tonight, the rules have been shattered. I don't need bitterness anymore. That made up my whole life. matters I finally know what that feels like if this was a movie it'd end like this shot of the sunset the lovers kiss but this is real and I feel like the clay spinning on a potter's wheel though it was not love at first sight it's, it's our story and the ending is ours to This way. It turn out this way. I don't understand the crazy I don't things understand that keep the happening to me keep today. Happening to me today. You're just another magic, unexplained phenomenon, and it's so crazy. is bright, fabulous, and carefree. The gays run half of Hollywood and hold hands publicly. Bullying's not half as bad as kids would like to claim. Oh. Besides, it gives them something to vlog about on their quest for instant fame. What the hell's a, a vlog? Oh, and gay marriage now is legal, though in four years, who can say? You get depressed, you shop online for discount, go to yay, trailer trash, and make millions off reality TV. Now, is that somehow different than reality? Yeah. Ain't it great how far we've come since 1973? future is great, there you are, what you own. If I could take you back with me, your mind would be blown. Being fabulous all the time can get a little pricey. 
see but the future is great oh trust me well sure sounds sparkly like a prize on the prices right oh it is and the bars put upstairs to shade hey you meet blue eyed boys with cheekbones that could cut clear through steel who hide in corners clutching over prize drinks like a shield though they pray to be seen one look into their eyes gives you the freeze like they Botox their souls, or maybe they're just scared of the disease. Nothing a little penicillin can't fix. Penic <laughs> Since talking is tedious, now iPhones are preferred. You can know everything about a boy without saying a word. And if it turns out that he's useless when he gets down on his knees, at least he'll go when you come and leave. But the future is great, <laughs> sort of. I never had a mentor. I've been out since I was 10, but sometimes I wish I'd been born different now and then. Maybe that's the reason I have a talent for design. I'm my biggest, best creation. Can't you tell? I turned out fine. So I guess you're all so lucky. Living in the 70s, there's no need to wear a condom. You can slut it up guilt-free. Nowadays, we have fancy drugs to help us all forget <laughs> how the 80s came. Killed all your friends. You just don't know it yet. Well, the future is great. I can't wait to get back and take little white pills for each panic attack. Just under the tongue in 10 seconds, I'm free. And I don't have to think about how great life's supposed to be. Thank you. And then we have a few members of the cast who won't be joining us for the Q&A. So we've got April, James, and Ben. Thank you guys so much for performing. That was wonderful. Where are you going? They're going to go explore Google. Okay. Raid the micro kitchens. That's the plan. All right, wonderful. Thank you guys the so what? much. Yes, I know, <laughs> I know that um, quite a few people in the audience weren't able to uh, see the play just yet, um, but they will be seeing it after this. So I would love for you guys to uh, introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about the character that you play. Uh, I'm Randy Red. Uh, I play Buddy. Buddy is um, <laughs> one of the older patrons in the bar. Uh, <laughs> The bitter old daddy. Um, he's also the uh, the piano player. He was uh, sort of a washed up singer songwriter who landed in this bar in New Orleans. I'm Anthony, and today um, I'm play. I was playing Freddie, a uh, Puerto Rican drag queen, um, with a heart of gold. Um, but I'm a swing, which is an understudy for a bunch of these fabulous people. And um, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody here at Google. Um, <laughs> I'm Nathan Lee Graham, and I play Willie um, in The View Upstairs. And Willie is the, uh, let's say he's the bon vivant <laughs> of the, uh, the View Upstairs. He's the, um, the matchmaker, the Dolly Levi, if you will. Um, he likes to bring people together, even if he has to use uh, alternative facts to do so. <laughs> so um, that's who I play, so you have to come and see him. I'm Taylor Fry. I play Patrick. He is uh, currently a hustler to make ends meet and stay alive. Yes. Moved to New Orleans to get out of his bad home situation when he was growing up. I'm Jeremy Pope, and I'm playing the character Wes, who is an aspiring fashion designer who is uh, sent back to New Orleans in 1973. And yeah, that's, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Nancy Ticotine. I play two roles in the show. The realtor who succeeds at selling this doo-doo head. No, he, he, he buys the, the building that is left. And I also play Inez, a mother of the drag queen in the at the bar. And the husband has left them, and she's supporting and doing the best she can to keep the family together. Her, in reality, in, in the real story, she has two sons at the bar. But in our show, she has one. That's incredible. Great, thank you guys so much. And um, how was it that you guys got involved with this play, or you found out about it and, and were cast? Were there any fun stories in, in terms of auditions or anything like that you want to share? I joined this show back in, there was a reading of the show in October, a developmental uh, week-long reading back in, I think, October, right? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I was not involved. <laughs> but uh, uh, come Wednesday afternoon, I'm, I, I teach class, and I was in the middle of class, and I got a phone call, can you come now and join the show? Can you learn the part and go on tomorrow? So we did two, wow. two performances on Thursday and Friday, uh, read, readings of the show, so I, I joined the cast sort of. Yeah. Out of the blue, yeah. <laughs> and thank God he did because he's fantastic in yes. the show. Thanks, Nathan Lee Graham. Yes. <laughs> Can you translate bon vivant? Bon vivant. Uh, uh, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> see what, I, see what I, I set you up there. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, the part of Willie was written for me, so that's how I became a part of this uh, wonderful musical that's based upon something that was very tragic that happened in 1973 in New Orleans. Um, Five years ago, almost, Max Vernon, who wrote the book, lyrics, and uh, music. So uh, that's how I got involved with this beautiful project. Some of us weren't involved at all and then just auditioned. Like, as an actor, you get a lot of appointments come in, and you go in and do your best, and you hear tons of no's, and then sometimes you get a yes. So that was this one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> You don't want to say anything? I was the same. I auditioned, and um, I hadn't heard about I had, I had heard about the project um, prior to um, auditioning for it. And then when I got the call to come in, um, I went in and I actually met Taylor, who was already hired. So it was kind of a cold read, and I had to interact. Oh, and, and didn't they moment. tell? They didn't tell you that I was in there, right? No, I, I, Which I, I is went into messed the room, up. and then he was there. And they're <laughs> like, so there. this is the person that is cast as the role. So create chemistry and go. So we did it. And <laughs> Usually, you know those things in advance. You yeah. can prep, and they didn't tell they didn't any tell of the me, boys. Which is great, but um, <laughs> we kissed in the room, and the sparks were flying. Fireworks. Yeah, but it, and, then, and then it was a yes. So feeling great about that. <laughs> <laughs> My story is a little similar <clears throat> to Randy's in that um, there was someone else in this role prior, and she got another job. She got bumped up into another job, and then they called me, and I was thrown into this. I was living upstate New York in the snow, and then I read the script. The next day I said yes. I packed two bags. The next day I was at rehearsal at 10 and didn't know where I was going to be that night, sleeping on couches for a long time, but out of the blue, just like that. I didn't know that about Randy. Interesting. That's beautiful. Uh, now, you had mentioned, even that this is a, a true story. Yeah. And well, can you tell it's me based more? upon a true story. Yeah. Well, um, and anyone can please jump in and, and uh, modify or correct, please. Um, but in 1973, there was an arson attack at uh, a lounge called the Upstairs Lounge in New Orleans. And uh, they're not sure who started the fire, but this fire did indeed kill 32 people. Um, some people got out. But it is 1973, it is the South, it is New Orleans, and so it was underreported, underinvestigated, and to this day, people are, you can literally, and no, all joking aside, Google it and find out more about it, but it's still an underreported, underinvestigated story. Mm -hmm. And it's our first Orlando, if you will, um, for the LGBTQ community. So it's a, an important story, a pivotal story, and what Max has done is taken the wonderful character of Wes that Jeremy plays um, from the present day and transports him back to 1973. And we all come alive. And uh, all of the uh, machinations and um, contradictions and uh, uh, differences between 1973 and the present day all happen in this one bar before uh, this tragedy happens. And so it's a beautiful story about something that was tragic that needs to be told. 
and I'm just so proud to be a part of it. Does anyone want to add? Yeah, as far as underreported goes, I grew up just north of New Orleans. I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old when this happened and never knew of it, never heard about it did until until this show came up. And there are still, like, I talk to my friends and family back home and even people in New Orleans who don't know this story. And it's just outrageous to me that it's gone mm -hmm. so missing, you know, from, mm -hmm. from our history, of you know, certainly, you know. Absolutely. What's cool is that now people are seeing the show, and I have two people that have contacted me who have had trips planned to New Orleans already, saw the show and went and found the bar and looked and saw the names outside of it. There's some in the sidewalk, there's some on the building. And so that's really that's really special. We get to kind of honor those those lives now. It's really something rare. It's incredible. Now it, it was underreported, and you guys mentioned that quite a bit that the news didn't cover it. Why do you feel like it wasn't covered when so many lives were lost? You know, before Orlando, which you had mentioned, this was the largest attack on the LGBT community. Does anybody want to? Well, I I would probably say that it's because they were all gay. <laughs> um, and I think that um, not only was it underreported, but the families of the victims, um, I'm sure a lot of them were quite embarrassed or um, felt some sort of shame about having their kids or their mm -hmm. kin or relatives at this place. That was kind well, of. Well, I mean, you would be fired. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you would lose your job, and your names would literally be put in the paper sometimes with your address, and you would lose your job for being even associated mm -hmm. with these people, let alone at the bar. So mm -hmm. there was shame on all fronts. Yes. And you, the people who were actually victims and the people who were actually there couldn't even express you know, their shame or their grief because for fear of being fired or for fear of being let go. So many, and, many uh, bodies were not claimed yeah, even, right? Many bodies were not claimed. There were people across the street who watched it, this place being uh, b burning down, and they did nothing. So, and they left uh, one particular member burnt to a crisp in, in the actual bars that were up to the windows. Um, if you know New Orleans, they have these very large windows that you can sort of walk out of. They're like doors. Well, this was on the second level, and so in order for drunk people not to fall out of them, they ironically put bars up to keep people safe. And then you have a fire, and there you have it. So, you know, the shame all around of uh, being a part or associated with the bar and the real lifetime um, happenings of not being able to tell people because you would be fired. Right. Cut to present day, where you can still be fired mm -hmm. if you are, you know, gay at certain, in certain places here in these United States, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Yeah. Uh, and we reference Orlando, and for, for those of you that don't know, um, in June, which is Pride Month of, of this past year, uh, there was a shooting that happened at a nightclub there called Pulse. And so when we say Orlando, or if we use the term Pulse, um, that's what we're referencing, which is now the largest um, killing of the LGBT community or hate crime towards the LGBT community. So that's what we're referencing there. How did it feel so, so soon after the Pulse shootings happened? How did it feel bringing this story to life? Was there an element that felt a bit more powerful? Did you feel like it was like the perfect time to bring this to light because it's so ironically similar to what just happened? I think um, for me particular, um, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I live here in New York City, but I was home when the shooting happened and we lost a bunch of familiar faces, people from high school, all types of things. So I didn't want to deal with what was ha what happened. I, it was very hard for me to deal with that. I came to New York after, and I just started auditioning and trying to forget. Um, so I thought I was going to be in LA, and then this project came along. I read the script, and I was like, I need to do this. I have to do this for me. I need to do this because this is so important. I didn't know about this New Orleans attack. Um, so like Nathan has mentioned, yes, it is tragic, but it's such a beautiful story where you get to meet so many individuals full of life, full of character, um, such important stories. And it, it's so great to be a part of a piece where not only are we creating art, but we're, we're 
we're sharing history. And I feel like that's so important to not forget our history and where we came from and those that came before us. Um, so for me in particular, it just struck a chord where every night feels like therapy where I go through and I get to meet these characters. And yes, it's sad, but it feels progressive. Like, okay, we have to keep fighting and we have to keep speaking up and we need to keep doing whatever we need to do um, to keep taking those steps forward in the community. Yeah. Great. It's so timely too um, with what's going on in society as far as um, the administration that we have currently happening. So it's it's a timely piece, a seminal piece in that way on all fronts. Mm -hmm. I really feel like it's just, um, we are a part of a larger community of artists who are putting out some really great work right now. And I mean artists at large too, because I think even what you guys do here um, contributes in so many ways uh, with communication, where communication is concerned. So that's so key. You know, I think the, the operative and big word today is, is communication, um, mm -hmm. dealing with people and uh, communicating with them. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. And, and we talk a lot about community and the importance of community and, and community then as well as now. Now, the bar, it was really interesting because it serves so many purposes. It was a church and it was a bar, but it was also like your hangout place and you do drag shows. And it just, it, I feel like every couple minutes it was just changing into morphing into something new. Um, what was the bar like for you and, and what did it symbolize for you? Well, I, I can speak from Buddy's perspective here. You know, Buddy is the the, the showman in the room. He, it's his room. It's his show. It's his night. And uh, I'd sort of take it away from him. But it is the place where Buddy can be himself. I didn't say that Buddy is married and has kids. Like, so he's living this other life inside the, the walls of the upstairs lounge, which I... You know, is while this is not based spe specifically on one guy, uh, is based on on reality for sure. Uh, you know this guy hiding out in this place. Um, so it is a place to to escape, and it is some kind of paradise for for all of these people. You know, yeah. um, so and and that it really is how it starts for me too. And the night sort of you know progresses. Or I think well, escape well, is a good word that he yeah. used because mm -hmm. for my character it definitely is that and has become kind of a safe haven for him to be who he is and much like what New York City was for me when I left Utah. <laughs> I kind of got to be myself and do my own thing and you know, explore everything I was. And I feel like Patrick gets to do that by just coming into this bar every night. So. Yeah. yeah, I remember in college, when I was in college, I went to school in, at Florida State, and there, you know, I grew up in this small town in Mississippi, and uh, I went to college in Tallahassee, and there was a, the gay bar in Tallahassee was very seedy, divey bar downtown in the basement of the Hilton Hotel up by the Capitol. And it was called Club Park Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Mirrors on the wall. It was like black velvet. And that was so, so seedy. And so much like this bar. There were, there were drag shows on Sunday nights. And that was my escape. You know, like that, I really felt then like I was in this place now. It, it, it's a very, very similar experience. I think for, for me, um, it's it's a place where my son can go and be himself and where it's safe. Because mm -hmm. even when we enter into the show, my character and my son in the show, it's after being, you know, beat up by a cop. So in this place is the only place where we can feel safe, relax, feel good in your skin, I think. That's great. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, speaking to uh, Inez and Freddie, um, they're Puerto Rican, so I think that even um, in their in their home and their family with their relatives, that, you know, they this would be something that would be really kind of shameful. And um, the fact that he can go there with his mom and kind of have this extended family is um, it's it's like a living room. It's like a you know, it's like grandma's house or something like that, where it's um, you know, you can go there and feel at home. Yeah. That's so true, and that's the vibe that I got as well. Fun, fun fact, I moved here from Utah as well, so wow. we're going to have to talk after. Yeah. Um, so so wow. much to talk about. Uh, but we talk about like it being this safe haven and this sense of community, and it, it symbolizes so many things now. And um, But then it, there's a song, and it talks about how you're, you're going to try to be a person, not a personality. And, and I feel like anymore now, our community or our safe haven is like we hide behind technology, and so we 
have these apps and we have these chat rooms and we have like I mean our whole, whole world our social network is that's our, our social world is is our um, social media or technology and we're a tech space so technology is very important to us um, but how has that morphed our um, sense of community and, and not necessarily it doesn't have to be a bad thing um, but how have things changed since the 70s in terms of the LGBT community and and what safe haven and and what that means now I'll speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that? I'll take it. Um, yeah, I mean, because my character is from 2017, so the Wes wants to be, he wants the following, he wants the Instagram following, the Twitter following, he feels like in order to be loved, he needs those things. In order to be respected as a fashion designer, he needs those things. So he jumps into this world in 1973 where these characters don't have that. They only have each other and this safe haven to spend time together and to fall in love and to fight and to argue and to fix all the things that are going wrong in life in this one place. So it's very interesting um, for him to kind of deal with that and see, to, yeah, the, just kind of dealing with that, I think. Um, but like you said, yeah, we live in this world now where we are living behind screens and that is so important. I've been to auditions where they want to know how many followers you have or that, it, that qualifies you more for X, Y, and Z. Um, so it's hard to grasp that because I don't know if we have the communication of face-to-face -face communities where we can go someplace and have real conversations with people um, or is it all just behind the screen of swipe left swipe right you know if I'm interested you know um, so I think Max has done a great job of just presenting the facts and kind of letting you deal with however you deal with your social life. It's not necessarily a show where we're preaching like, we need to get off our phone. You know, it's just the reality of how things work, you know, and there's positivity in that and negativity in that and you kind of um, can stray either way. I do love Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really do. The problem that I'm finding with it is people only put out, I've made this goal in the last year. My husband was like, if you're going to be on it as much as you are, be your authentic self. So I've made this goal to try to be myself on Instagram. Like, no holds barred, just go for it. And that's one of the issues is we only put out there what we want other people to see or what our insecurities are. We're hiding, we're putting them away. And people can actually start living in this reality world of what they're putting out to their followers as themselves and like lose themselves. It's kind of crazy. I saw a TED talk on this and if the effects on the brain of it, you actually start to lose yourself a little bit and you count on what other people are seeing as being the real you. And it's insane. Excuse me while I post on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, old, I'm one of the older members of the cast, and uh, so my relationship with technology is antagonistic at times because I, I'm an artist, so my whole thing is about... Um, it's all these contradictions. My whole thing is about actually dealing with real people, you know, and making that sort of connection, even if it's through celluloid, but connecting with real sort of human emotion, but at the same time, I'm acting. So, you know, or I'm being, right? So there's always these constant contradictions, and so you're trying to be this real artist, quote unquote, and then you have this element of social media that you have to deal with, which sometimes takes you out of your artistic self, but it needs to gird or support what you're doing artistically. Yeah. So there's this constant give and take and flux um, gener generationally with me in particular, uh, where I'm like, can someone else younger do this for me? <laughs> While I work on the art? <laughs> Well, what's crazy is it's so tied now. Yes. Like, it really yeah. is tied to it promote really your is. show or whatever. You have to put that out on, with your name t uh, attached to it. Absolutely. So whether your personal life is there, I mean, it's just a lot. And it's, it's a all lot. together. And it's exhausting! <laughs> but. Here we are. Here we are. And, and here, At Google, here are. doing the live feed. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, I, as you should. So we're going to open it up for audience Q&A here in just a moment. So if you guys do have any questions, feel free to line up. We've got um, the microphones on, on either side here for you all. Uh, so 
it sounds like there's so many life lessons. And when I walked away, I was like social media cleanse and changed, like had my sister change my password. So now I'm like off social media because I'm like, I need to be in the moment and I need to be that person and not a personality. And um, I felt like there were so many lessons strewn throughout and interwoven throughout the entire play. What do you guys feel is the one thing that if people walk away, you hope they got that? Oh, that's a great question. Wow. Well, I, I think what gets me and what I love that the audience gets is the political point of view that we speak of in the show. Um, people relate to it and they find solace. When they leave the theater, they're moved emotionally. They feel comforted that it's being addressed in an artistic way. It's not being knocked over your head. You don't read it, et cetera. It's something you experience with us. Um, his character is, is primary in that goal. Um, and we all backstage eight shows a week. As long as we're there, we are re-experiencing what is happening in the world and, and sharing our common goals or our, our wish that we can all move forward and find emotional happiness and make progress in the world. And I think that, I think the audience does get that. I feel that. I would say, um, you know, the political climate that's all very um, prevalent in the show and the technology aspect and how people, as we were discussing, can lose themselves. But besides that, I would just say that this is going to sound so cliche, but there's such a message of love in this show. Mm -hmm. Because these people in the South in 1973 had to find themselves in a little room together as these to let their freak flag f kind of fly. And I just can't help but finish the show every night just thinking about love and acceptance and just being who you are and celebrating our differences instead of trying to hide them and hinder people from being different. Um, I think this kind of ties in everything, but the past few months have been kind of trying for me personally for, you know, for like what he said about you know our administration and all this kind of stuff that seems so out of my hands and just like oh my god they're going to kill me and everyone i love you know and i think that for me the blessing of being a part of this show with all these people was kind of that escape with like-mindedness and um, love and kind of a celebration of things that of, of all the things that make us different mm -hmm. so i find that when i speak to my friends who come to see the show after they kind of experienced that what I've been, that kind of like escape, they experience that in that, in that hour and 40 minutes. And there's usually this kind of like um, energized smile on their face or like a, a sense of relief after that, you know, things will be okay. And um, I don't know, I feel like they kind of learn along with Wes and that's always the kind of best thing for me. That's great. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you so much for being here. Um, love the show. Thank was there last you. week, gonna go again this week. Yeah, Sheree, great job moderating. Um, my question is, so when I was at the show, uh, what really struck me was your script, right? Your dialogue and all, you know, your songs and poetry. It was just absolutely amazing. I was wondering, do you guys have like one favorite lyric or like one favorite sentence that you're just absolutely obsessed and when you read it, you were like, oh my gosh, like it totally speaks to me. Something that really, you know, your favorite line from the show. Maybe from your character, from your fellow characters as well. There's so many. So many. Mine is we've got an iron bond, no hate could break apart that he sings. Obsessed with that line. I like your line. I told you this. You don't. Uh, it's, it says, uh, "I'm a total fa failure." Well, look at me. I'm a total failure, but my life is not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. Oh God, it's so hard because yeah. there's so many wonderful so many lines. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm so I'm so in it that uh, that I've gone beyond the actual context of the line. Uh, content of the line, I'm more about how it sounds, right? So, because they're all good. Not all the lines are good. So my current, because it changes after a couple of weeks, my current sounding line that I love so much, Michael Longoria is not here, but he says, he has a line, where is my dress? <laughs> <laughs> I love that right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
It makes me laugh every night. I'm off stage, and I just love it. That's amazing. All right, and and Nancy, um, so that would be your your son in in the play, right? And what I found so interesting was that it was based in the '70s, but you were so supportive of him, and and you were so loving, and just you took him as he was, and it was beautiful, and it was something that like I longed for. My mom is wonderful and very supportive, um, but it was more than just like a love of him, it was of everyone and everything that he was. And that's so rare even today. How did it feel playing a character where it's like in the 70s when it's like you think of everyone hates everyone that's yeah, different? It, it's How was very, that? Uh, my experience personally is that, first of all, I was a dancer. Mm -hmm. I was one of the original members of Ballet Hispanico of New York. And so I lived my life with a lot of gay guys, always. And my parents, it was just part of our life. It was There was no question. I never even, one of my cousins was one of the dancers in the show and I, in the company and one day he said to me Nancy I just have to tell you I'm gay and I'm like I know and he was like, oh. you know like he was so scared about it but with this show um, I mean she struggled it wasn't like oh you're gay it's fine and no she went through a lot of hassles and she was scared and she doesn't know anything about how to live a life with a gay guy, her kids, and then the husband leaves her and she's mm -hmm. there and she's struggling on her own, but that's the love. Yeah. And it's a, it's a mother's love, not just for him, but for everybody in yeah. the bar. You know, like I feel like it's kind of a universal, I'm the big mama, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and so, um, and I'm so connected to Michael who plays the role yeah. We just have this bond and uh, we have a lot of fun with it. But it's a challenging, I find that the whole show, and I'm used to doing singing and dancing and acting and kicking my legs and all that. And I don't do that in this show, but I find the show very challenging mentally, vocally, emotionally. It takes a lot of my concentration and I love that because then yeah. I'm growing and I'm sharing. I think it's, mm -hmm. I love to have that challenge. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like um, this character embodies some of like who you are too. Like that absolutely. Truth in that, in and that I have moment. so many people after yeah. the show that I speak to. They're like, "Oh my God, I wish my mother was like you. You're like the dream fantasy mother." I swear they say those lines to me, which yeah. are in the show too. Yeah, it's yeah. it's wonderful. I love That's it. That's amazing, and it's definitely how I felt afterwards. I was like, "Please be in my life forever." It's been so <laughs> wonderful. Um, but I I just loved it so much. That was probably one of my favorite parts, and it's something you. that I just longed for, I guess, and in, in that yearning. Um, so my, my last question for you guys today, this is for Nathan. What, what would you think is the biggest difference in terms of dating 1973 to today? Well, all of you kids are spoiled. <laughs> Nowadays you can't walk into a bathroom without 10 guys following you into your stall. <laughs> But once upon a time, things were not so simple. There was no cruising on the bread lines. In my early 20s, I uh, had to intercept more coded messages than the Allied forces. <laughs> but I was hungry for love, and I certainly found it. Painters, poets, diplomats, sailors galore. <laughs> even a sword swallower. <laughs> I had them all. They, of course, fell deeply in love with me. How could they not? It is an undisputed fact that I had the best legs in all of Nolans, for a man or a woman. Mr. Balanchine told me himself, when I auditioned for the Ballet Hoos de Monte Carlo in 1940, Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> now mind you, I'm no dancer, but he was ready to take me on my silhouette alone. Except for that nasty prima ballerina, Danny Lofa. Oh, she was a fright and jealous too. How I would have loved to tweeze every wayward hair off her boorish Russian face. <laughs> but who would have known where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs>
Thank and you, you can see that monologue <laughs> eight times a week, done in a very different way, <laughs> with lots of physicality, at the Lynn Redgrave on uh, Bleecker in Lafayette, yeah. Tuesday yeah. through Sunday. Yeah, so, so true. You can also visit them at theviewupstairs.com, or you can visit them on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, the handle is at theviewupstairs. Thank you guys so much for your Thank time. You. Please, let's yeah. give them another round Thank of applause.